So, Berto, you contacted me the other day, and you're like, hey, Kirk, let's talk about Nexium, the uh, cult sex slavery thing that's blowing up on the internet. Uh, why did you want to do an episode about Nexium? Yeah, man. It was like I had seen the these little news items pop up a few months ago about, uh, you know, how like this famous Allison Mack actress from Smallville was involved in the sex cult and all these things. And at first it was just like such a random story that I didn't really know what was up. But I, got, I started getting interested. For some use, reason, YouTube kept recommending you, uh, videos to me. Maybe do, is my search history all about sex dungeons or something? Like, I don't know. But I kept getting recommended these videos about this stuff. And uh, not necessarily just about Nexium, but about related topics. And I started diving a little deeper into it. And then I realized that it is very much related to other things that we've talked about, some of the stuff you've done episodes on, uh, related to to cults, pyramid schemes, uh, kind of mind control, uh, and, and, and then sort of also sexuality and male dominance and a lot of these themes. And, and then I, I thought, well, th that's interesting. And then there was an another angle, which is that we've, we've talked a little bit about landmark before and and of course the two things are not directly related at all but there have been similar lawsuits uh, that have come up and so all this came up in my mind i was like we got to do an episode about this plus there's uh allison mack she's an actress and we do a lot of pop stuff so <laughs> yeah every day we get some email or comment from uh our landmark episode landmark for those who don't know is a seminar organization that's been around for a couple decades and they put on these seminars for self-improvement and self-discovery and they are considered by some to be a glorious service that completely freed people's minds and helped them to face themselves and right. and face their fears and improve their lives and and then there's another group of people that consider it to be a cult and harmful and uh, nefarious right and it's it's a little tricky because i feel like is there a cult where the people that are currently fully in it don't claim great things about it and so well, it's always hard to tell where that line is <laughs> yeah and with landmark if you want to hear the full discussion listen to that it's called i think critique of landmark or landmark critique yeah. or Something like that. I think we did it about a year ago in 2017 is my guess, maybe 2016. And Berto, you went to some, I, I went to some landmark things back in the day. And so, you know, you can listen to that. But anyway, so Nexium. Right. Uh, so let's go through uh, a number of different questions in the history and stuff and debate, you know, is, is it a cult? Is it a pyramid scheme? Uh, is it a slavery cult where these people brainwashed? What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, a professor, and I'm guessing the only thing close to this that I was involved with was Landmark. I almost got sucked into Scientology before I even knew what Scientology was <laughs> in 1989. Uh, but again, listen to the Landmark episode to learn more about that. Who are you, Berto? My name is Humberto Castaneda, and I design meaningless tattoos. So just to bring people up to speed to the end of this story, so you know where this is headed, is there's this guy named Keith Ra Rainieri. Uh, Keith Rainieri. And, Vanguard. And yeah, so he, he fashions him. He makes everyone call him Vanguard. But anyway, and, uh, and member Allison Mack, who was Chloe on Smallville, uh, Keith and Allison were arrested uh, a, a year ago in early 2018 on federal charges, including sex trafficking and forced labor, forced labor, essentially slavery. Yeah. Uh, it's a legal term for sex slavery. Yeah. And they, Keith Ranieri had, has been involved in similar activities for a few decades and uh, came to, to this the company Nexium. Next, if you're not familiar, it, we're pronouncing it Nexium, but it's 
It's spelled N X I V M. Yeah, like Roman numeral style. <laughs> yeah, which I find to be uh, obnoxious. But anyway, uh, I mean, it's like the sort of thing a rapper would call themselves. Right. You know? Right. Um, but anyway, uh, and when a rapper does it, I find it not obnoxious. But I mean, yeah, it's. <laughs> I'm sure it's easier to trademark when it's. But Nexium was was Nexium a thing? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and next, when you hear Nexium, you just think scam, scam something. <laughs> it does sound a little scammy. <laughs> or, or the new Toyota Nexium. Oh, you know? yeah. But anyway, uh, so the company has been basically shut down, and a trial will be in a couple months. In April 2019, Keith and Allison are are going to go on trial, or or one of them, or right. something. So we're going to see what happens there. So. Um, what does Nexium offer to people that you know of? Yeah, it seems like they presented themselves as this uh, kind of in the vein of uh, becoming the the best you can become, uh, transcend human traditional human barriers, uh, and and sort of like discover yourself, uh, have better relationships, uh, have a better professional track you know, career, et cetera, and really break down the barriers that along those lines, you know, it's similar to other self-improvement things, but also at least how I read into it a little bit with a little bit of new aginess to it, like new agey mysticism to it. Oh, I didn't catch that. I yeah. mean, you looked into it more than I did. Like, like what? Uh, you know, because they, they sort of believed in the power of uh, like a lot of the references to to things that that you can oh you know how like what's that book the secret yeah you know I have sort of manifest your own reality those kind of things oh I I don't know if new agey is the right term but it's certainly like where it's not just all grounded in reality and real world rules it's you can change reality with your thoughts and 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 I'm not saying they are the same as the secret but it had a lot of elements that I felt along those lines mm. and part of it is that this guy. Rainier, is that how you say it? Rain, Rainieri. Rainieri. So he calls himself Vanguard. By the way, do you know why? No. There was a video game, an arcade game in the 80s called Vanguard. And that was his favorite game, I guess. Did you play that game? No, I didn't know it. I, mean, uh, I don't remember it. But he called himself after the name of that video game. <laughs> but, uh, but I guess the, uh, he said because in the game you have to, like by conquering... You become more powerful, and you save you and your and your people, or something like that. Oh. Uh, but anyways, the the point is that he was re uh, reported to have like this ridiculously if you started, high. If you started a cult, what video game character would you name yourself after? Tron. <laughs> <laughs> he was reported to have like this ridiculously high IQ, like two seventy or something. Yeah. And so from the get go, even before he did yeah, next so anything, just to put a fine point on that, he claims that he is among the top three tested IQs of all time. Now, by the way, does the IQ scale go to 270? No. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what, what, you, scale, what we mean right. by it because yeah. it's all, it's a statistical, it's, it, oh, it's more see, meaningful right. to talk about standard deviation, sure, sure, right? Sure, sure, sure. Like you have an average which is designated as 100. Right. And, but and it's it, like Einstein's supposed to be like 160 or something. So this guy's like 100 points over Einstein. Well, <laughs> once you get beyond like even like 145, the numbers get a little funny because the, the, designation, the designation between a 160 and a 165 is, is kind of meaningless. You're, yeah. you're, just, you're, just in, you're in the top 99.9 very, very <laughs> right. percentile. Right. Um, and if you go up to, two, I've never heard of anyone claiming that they had a test where they were, they were 270. The tests that we psychologists use, yeah, they tend to cap out at yeah. like 160 or 170. I so think. in either case, I think was this was part of the initial mystique even way before Nexium, and and so you know I think what he was selling initially was like, well, yeah, I'm super smart, but you too can unlock this unlimited potential kind of thing, you know, and, and right. Yeah, so he's, as you're describing, there's a certain element of this that is really quite mundane, which is the uh, someone selling their uh, you know, services yeah. to improve people's lives, which is essentially what I do for a living. Right. I don't market it that way, you know, but it's not that different, you know. Yeah. Come to me, pay me money, and I will improve your life. 
you know, I, yeah. that, I don't market myself that way, but that's the implication. Right. And so there's a lot of what he's doing is really quite mundane. It's just weird that so many of these organizations have so many problems. Like I'm trying to think of one organization that markets themselves like this, that doesn't have some kind of weird aspect to it. I mean, I would, I would, I would actually say landmark is probably one of the ones that has the least, the amount, least. <laughs> least amount of problems. That's a good point. Well, uh, at least that we've heard publicly, right? Right. And the, uh, offenses that landmark will uh, you know do upon their people is like uh, take their money or well, yeah, or, the press, stuff. or pressure the members to pressure other people right to come right and, and that's pretty low grade which by the way i would i would categorize it like an amway thing and and in the sense that uh as far as i ever heard amway wasn't like you know going after people and discrediting their name and all these things. I never heard stories like that, but it was really all like high pressure pyramid scheme. You know? Right. So there's a lot of this sort of thing and quite mundane. And that's, I think, right. why he was sort of under the radar. So let me ask you, Berto, was this a multi-level marketing scheme or company? Uh, I believe so, because that was what he specialized in. Yeah. Like, uh, it, my understanding is he started, like, his first big thing he did was this consumer level marketing thing. Yeah. And that was uh, essentially, I don't know if it's a pyramid it was, scheme, but it was like, hey, everyone pitch in so we have more bargaining power to get cheaper stuff. Right. But then it turned out he got, it was fraud. Like, he got sued and all these things, right? Yeah. It was called Consumer Byline. It oh, was, that's what consumer. it was his organization prior to Nexium. Consumer byline, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So do you know the definition of a multi-level marketing company? Not really. I mean, I not really. I don't, I mean, I know what I feel it is, but I don't know. Well, what do you feel it is? So to me, it's where there is a very highly concentrated, but very small set of individuals at the top that reap pretty much the bulk of the benefits. And then they set up a structure where every member underneath is required to get more and more members underneath them. And each one of those members is supposed to contribute up. And it's sort of like the mob. It's set up a little bit like the mob. Like everyone is expected to pay their tariff or their dues. So in the end, the people just a couple levels down really don't make that much out of the system. In fact, many times lose money out of the system. But the few at the top make ridiculous amounts of, of money. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this. And from the little bit that I read, what you're describing is a pyramid scheme. Mm -hmm. which is often very similar as a Venn diagram I see, okay. of multi-level marketing. So the stuff that I read was that multi-level marketing is the, the you know, defining feature is that the members are encouraged to spend money on classes or products or something. And they are also encouraged to recruit others mm -hmm. to the organization so that they can move up levels. I see. So, and so this is, uh, and as they move up levels, they get more prestige or money, money yeah, yeah. or, or the upper levels are only, you know, better classes are only available to upper level people. Right. So it's, it's kind of like, like Scientology in that way. And like Amway is that way too, right? Amway is a multi-level marketing, but right. it's also classified as like a pyramid scheme. Right. So the definition of a pyramid scheme is that you are, uh, it, it's a, it's basically fraud in that you trick everyone, particularly at the lower levels, as right. you were saying, into be, into basically believing that they're guaranteed to have a return on investment. Yeah. And, uh, but everyone knows at the top, because they have stats on this sort of thing, because they keep track of it, because they have to in order to make the money. You know, they have, to, right. they have to keep track of every member and how much money they're making and how much money they're spending. And by definition, a pyramid scheme uh, everyone can't have a return on investment because what they're investing in is something that's false. You know, right. it's a Ponzi scheme. The money just goes up the pyramid. And so the definition of pyramid scheme is that, as you said, the people at the upper levels are, 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 are rolling in money. Right. And then, like you said, just a couple levels down, like if you have 50 levels, the top three levels are making a shit ton of money maybe, you know, four to 10 are sort of breaking even. And then 11 through 50, you're losing money. Losing money. But you're you, the ones funding the top. <laughs> right. 
But right. you're sold a bill of goods right. or convinced or, you know, false advertisement, so to speak, yeah. that you definitely are going to move up the ranks. But by right. definition, you can't, or there always has to be somebody at the bottom, right? Yeah, the right. Whole, the whole, the whole uh, structure is based on taxing the poor and giving to the rich, you know? In other words, if, if you were just trying to sell the goods and make the money that way and say, you know, like, you know, imagine you, you and I start a company and we're going to sell empanadas, right? Delicious Colombian style empanadas. Actually, we should do this. Uh, well, we probably do some math and we figure, okay, here's how much it costs to create a thousand empanadas. Here's how much we can sell them for. What would be our company name? Uh, Le Empanadier? No, that's too complicated. Uh, uh, yum Yum? How about, uh, how about... Um Amway empanadas. <laughs> Imp way. <laughs> so no, but the, the point is we figure out a way to hopefully start the business without immediately start losing money, right? So we, we're like, okay, we're not rolling in the dough, uh, pun intended, yeah. but we are selling enough to where at least we're paying our bills and stuff like that. And then we figure, and there's a little overhead and then we're like, okay, great. And now let's figure out how we get a little more efficient. And then maybe if we hire one more employee, we can make a little more, you know, like we do that. It's not the case with these things. It's not like they could be successful selling the initial product. They have to have the real product is the people at the bottom contributing the money up. Right. And that's what I, I've experienced uh, when I when I was, uh, when people were trying to rope me into the Amway thing. It was like that, that thing you were saying, how you, you sold this bill of goods because they show you all these riches you could accrue. And the fact you, you won't even have to work after a certain point. Like you do this, work hard for like a year in this thing and you're basically set. Yeah, you know? it's, it's kind of weird that it's illegal because... That there, it's legal. No, it's oh. illegal. Oh, that it's illegal. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Pyramid schemes are have become illegal in, oh, in the United States. But Amway is still a thing, right? Well, or, organizations that previously were pyramid schemes are allowed. Oh, okay. but a But an organization that is organized as a quote-unquote okay. pyramid scheme according to the law, it, it's illegal. Okay. Uh, which I find to be interesting because... The, there's, they're not explicitly lying to you. You know, they never, if they guarantee it, you know, then there's one thing, but they don't usually guarantee, right? They're, they're mostly saying like, there's this opportunity. If you, and if you do the, if you do, if you work it right, then this is going to work for you. And, it, and you're very likely to have it work for you, right? It, I mean, it's probably similar to shark loan, like uh, shark loans or, you know, ursuri. How do you say it? Ursuri? I don't know. Like where I say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a loan and because I know you're desperate, I'm the only one who's going to give you that loan. And the catch is my interest rate is 30%, 40%, right? And, and you're like, well, well loan I have sharks, no choice. They would be like 50% in, in a month. Right. You know? And, but you're like, I have no choice. So I have to take it. So t you, you know, someone could ask the question, it's like, I don't know. It's a consensual thing between adults. Why do you care if it's, but it is abusive, right? It's like, I'm abusing your situation. Well, it's just interesting that in the land of the free and mm -hmm. the land of capitalism, that there are certain things that f f in my estimation, arbitrarily have been decided to be. Uh, you know, beyond a certain threshold and yeah. the government has decided that it's illegal because there's all sorts of practices that are going sure. on in the United States. I was just listening to a podcast about how pharmacies are, there's this total racket between the pharmacy organization and like CVS, which is like a big oh, pharmacy. Yeah. And they own both the pharmacies and the middleman. And so any mom and pop pharmacy that comes along the CVS conspires to get rid of them. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and as a result, according to research, because some states, they, they don't allow that. They, they force people to use private pharmacies. In the states like North Dakota, where they force people to use private pharmacies, healthcare is better. It's cheaper. Oh, wow. Uh, people live longer. You know, there's less mistakes. Like, there's these obvious benefits. You know, because the, the no, you know, everyone has this notion of like, if we switched, you know, we got to get away from mom and pop. We got to go to the big corporations because they have uh, higher uh, scales. They can uh, lower margins, lower yeah. prices, you know, more variety, more choice, blah, 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 more or oversight or something. And the mom and pop, there's all these problems, but it's actually not true. Not true. <laughs> and why do we allow that? Right. You know, that's screwing over the customer. It's kind of fraud and in my, it's, it's antitrust. Um, anyway, um, so 
uh, what other pyramids, famous pyramid schemes are there besides Amway and Nexium that you, um, in let's history? See. Well, actually, uh, did, did we talked about this before. Did Bernie Madoff count? No, uh, that Ponzi was a scheme. Ponzi scheme. Similar, very similar. similar. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's a, it's a it's different because it's one person going to a bunch of people and saying, "I will I will guarantee you a rate yeah. of return of twenty percent." Right. And this person's like, "Wow." you know, I have a million dollars to invest and my friend is making 20% right. and, and has actually received money back from him. Right. So, you Why know, not? other places I'm going to get 5%. Yeah. So boom. Okay. Here's a million dollars. Well, then a year comes up and he has to pay this person $200,000. Yeah. So in order to pay that, he goes to 10 more people and says, I, I'm going to guarantee you 20%. Right. <laughs> Give me a million dollars and, and look and listen to these testimonials. Right. And then, you know, they invest. So now he has, you know, $12 million and he gives 200,000. A few people. And then he, but another year comes up and now he has to pay out $2 million right. in, in dividends. And he has to go to a hundred people, but, right. but he, he says, look at these 12 people. Look at people. these 12 people, yeah. And then they're like, oh my God. So they give him a million dollars. Yeah. And they're, but they're not investing in anything real. No, no. It's just a, it's an ever growing uh, sl slosh of horribleness. If you, there's actually a movie with Jack Black, we've talked about this before on yeah. Netflix, about a real, a real story of a guy who it kind of seemingly inadvertently created a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. He was a polka singer and he had this polka band and he was i think a polish immigrant if i'm not mistaken and to the united states and he wanted to fund his polka band because the band members were like we can't play live anymore because we have to do our jobs right. and this, we have to travel <laughs> and so he's like okay okay i'll find investors and so he just it was a slippery slope so you can kind of see how Someone, robbing peter to pay paul <laughs> right and then it all came falling apart um other famous pyramid schemes herbal life oh okay you've heard of herbal life right uh i have i didn't realize it was a pyramid yeah. scheme. i mean okay. i don't know i didn't look into the specifics but uh oh what about that mary Kay? or no maybe i don't want to i don't no, know there was some sort of like beauty product thing maybe well there was shackley Okay. So you probably, people probably don't remember Shackley, but I do because my mom was involved in Shackley. Shackley? Yeah. I don't think my mom ever got uh, impacted negatively by it, but it was a similar kind of thing to Amway and Herbalife. So I think I talked about this before in one of the other episodes. There was a huge one in Colombia, uh, I think five years ago or something like that. It, it was so blatantly wrong. I remember I was visiting at the time and one of my relatives is like, we, we drove by this huge banner. And the banner said something like, you know, make, uh, you know, uh, get free furniture or something like that. And I was like, oh, what's that about? It's like, oh, you don't know? And it was this famous thing. Everyone knew about it. And I'm like, what, what's the deal? Oh, yeah, it's really weird. You know, like, they're like it's really weird. But you go to this place and you basically, uh, you can get stuff for free. And I'm like, what do you mean you can get stuff for free? Yeah, like TVs, furniture. You just get stuff for free. And I'm like, uh, I'm sure there's a catch, right? Well, and essentially it was a pyramid. It was a huge uh, or a pyramid scheme slash the, the Ponzi scheme where it, first of all, is definitely mob run, run. Like it was run by the mob. And it was a thing where they would have some people uh, put some money. You, you would put some money down and essentially that entitled you to get like 10x back, kind of like the Bernie Madoff thing, and get and you would get all these prizes. You could get a free TV, a free couch, a free, all these kinds of things. Uh, and, and like you said, there were people talking about how it happened to them. So one relative tells the other, dude, I got like, first of all, I doubled my, quadrupled my money and I got a free TV. It's crazy. Same thing, of course just a few examples and then everyone floods in the whole thing collapsed there was a huge scandal and unfortunately i don't even know if anyone paid the pied piper because it was like some shady mob characters were running it so i don't right even... right so if you are uh, you start off with the intention of fleeing after a certain point then yeah. you create the organization from the start protecting the owners so to right. speak and the and the people who are going to make all the money and then it's at some point you pull you know you're going to pull the plug right and walk away with you know how, however much money it is. and and sadly it had people mortgaging houses selling things selling cars putting all their savings into the thing yeah 
And the other thing that I think this is poignant uh, uh, to is that, uh, that's not a real phrase, but is that when you are suffering financially, this preys on poor people, essentially. Totally. It, you go to a rich person and you sell them the Amway uh, pitch, they're not going to buy it. One, because they don't need it. And two, because they're already making money and, and yeah. they're already doing things. And they look at this and they're like, well, it, it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. And maybe it is. But when you're desperate and you're living paycheck to paycheck or you can't feed your kids or you can't afford health care or you live in Colombia and you don't even have a job or something, you know, you're thinking like, well, I, you're so desperate and your needs are so great that you will convince yourself of things that you wouldn't convince yourself of normally. Totally. And you, because of the power of the brain, you will, uh, you know, with, with, even though there's lots of evidence pointing in the direction of there are red flags here, you're going to ignore that because you need this to be true. It's a sim, it's the same way with the lottery. Yeah. Most rich people, people above a certain level of income, you know, traditionally don't, don't buy lottery tickets. Right. Uh, why is that? You know, it's because people at the lower end are so desperate that, and they're sold also a bill of goods regarding capitalism and materialism that unless they have, you know, a nice car and a nice home and all these things then they're basically worthless and, and they literally don't get respect from society without those things. Right. Then you are forced into a situation where you're like, well, I need some way to get my self-worth. I need some way to get respect. I need some way to get security. And then this marketing pitch comes along and says like, buy a lotto ticket and you'll be a billionaire or whatever. And even though people who are poor are just as smart as people who are rich, even though people who are poor know just as much about statistics, you know, are, are just as likely to know about probability as people at the upper end, they buy a lot more tickets because why? Because right. they are, they believe because they need to believe. Right. And, you know, the fact is, is lotto tickets, you're essentially just giving money to the government. There's no, the, the chances of winning the lottery are essentially zero. Uh, the, you know, it's, what is it like? 70 million to one or something that you'll win right. one of those things or maybe even higher than that. And so when you, so there's lots of effects. And so when a pyramid scheme comes along or something along those lines, uh, it, it, it just preys on that phenomenon. And the real problem I think is society in that we one have income disparity meaning that we have extremely poor people who are really struggling in a society where lots of people are just rolling in money. Yeah. And then you create a culture that makes it so that if you're poor, you're basically nothing. You're basically not even human. And you create a system that it's, it's very clear who's the winners and who are the losers. You know, all you got to do is the way people talk will indicate who's a winner and who's a loser. And you just pound this into people's heads over and over and over again. And then, uh, and then it creates these opportunities. If we had a different society, then we wouldn't be vulnerable to this silliness. Totally. Well, and people that have, that are well-to-do, especially if they've been well-to-do all their lives. or Like, you know, recently there was this comment from one of the uh, politicians uh, about the, the, the government workers that are not making money. And it was unbelievably uh, disconnected. He, they were saying, well, why are they going to like soup kitchens? Do they not know they can just go get a loan against their future earnings? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh my God, man. You know, like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't understand. And, and also like sort of the disbelief is like, it's just two paychecks. What's, what's the big deal? Yeah, how, how, you you're telling me that two paychecks is all it takes for you to have financial. Yes, that's literally what's true. <laughs> yeah, I, I find that even liberals will have extremely uninformed, really hateful attitudes towards like the tent people in Seattle. Right. Right. Um, you know, Seattle. I don't. And other towns as well will have tent cities. Yeah. Essentially, the government or various organizations like churches or something will get together and say like, instead of just having people live wherever they can find a spot to, to live, 
why don't we create these little tent organizations and we'll provide a little bit of security and maybe it'll concentrate, you know, resources like soup kitchens and right. clean socks and medical care. And we can actually help people to get out of that, you know, help people to go up to the next level of functionality, right? right. And you solve a certain problem of, of communities where instead of having, like I had a homeless guy in my old house, you remember the house I live in Lake City? Yes. I had this big tree in the front of my yard uh, that was, that had these beautiful sweeping um, cedar branches that were sweeping on the ground. Okay. And it was a huge tree and it, it was rare in that the branches on the ground were still on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Usually- I'm trying to remember it, but I, I don't quite picture it. Where, where you parked the cars, it would have been like right, right, oh, okay. right next to the car. And my, I'll, I'll just tell the story. My neighbor- who lived on the, so my, my tree was right up against a fence. And then on the mm -hmm. other side of the fence was in my neighbor's house. And they had a refrigerator in their backyard, okay. like just in on the porch. It was just a fridge sitting there. And they were noticing, they didn't talk with me about this. This was all told to me later that someone was stealing stuff out of their, oh, out of okay. their fridge. And they were, you know, trying to figure it out. And then finally they, they was like, is someone, is someone like s sleeping in the woods? Cause, and there's not woods. There's just like a couple smattering of little bushes of, you know, bunches uh -huh. of trees. They look over my fence and they see a sleeping bag underneath my tree. Oh. And they, and you'd had to really look because. It's kind of hidden. You, yeah. If you just walked by the tree, there's no way. I mean, every day I'd walk, I'd drive home. I'd park <laughs> right, right next to that tree. Right. Never, you had no idea. Yeah, and, and they discovered that basically some homeless guy was sleeping in, in my tree. That's crazy. Just like 20 feet from my front door. Right, right. And so 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 I went to, I went to work at, at to Antioch at like 8 in the morning, and I was coming back at like 2, 8, 2 p.m. or 1 p.m. I was just gone for like four hours. Yeah. I just went to teach a class and came back home. They had discovered it while I was at Antioch. By the time I get home from Antioch, they have, with a chainsaw, cut off all the lower branches of my tree. What? Yeah. Oh my God. In, in an effort to solve a problem on my property. Oh my God. Yeah. Like they, it, it, this tree looked, this tree was beautiful before they did this. And they just complete, without. Wow. I was gone for four hours. Yeah. They, they probably busted out the chainsaw probably within an hour of the time I was, I was returning home. What did you do? So I got out of did my you car. Sue them? So I got out of my car and I'm, I'm looking at them because they're, they're kind of still doing it. Yeah. And I'm like, what's going on? And they, you know, they explain the whole thing to me. And then it occurs to me like, you could, in my head, I'm running through a scenario in my head. I'm like saying these words like, why didn't they wait for me? Right. And this is my yard. And of course I'd be concerned about this. There are other solutions yeah. than, than raping my tree. You know what I mean? Right. I could sue them. It's maybe even like some kind of citation of some kind. Right. It's like damage, like vandalism. Yeah. yeah. You know? <clears throat> and I, I ran th all that through my head and said, I could win this. This is all within like a half a second. And then I said, but what good would that do? Sure. Like these people live next to me. Oh man. Uh, is this going to happen again? No. <laughs> like this is, this is a weird, they've never done anything. Were they explaining it just like a normal thing? Like, oh yeah, we just had to because blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. No apology. No, I'm sorry. In fact, what I think happened was in their minds, yeah. I was to blame. Oh. Like to them, they were like, we'll show him for what he, you know, for not paying more attention or having a tree oh that's God. having a tree that's essentially like an attractive nuisance to someone doing this. Like, I think they actually felt they were not only justified, but actually oh. like they were punishing the wicked, you know, like oh, I was, a man, I was a wicked person for having a tree that was too easy to hide in. I'm lucky that didn't happen to me because I might've been chopped by the by their yeah. chainsaw because i would have been 
unable to contain myself the way you sound like you contain it. Well, because again, I just ran through in my head. I'm like, oh, man. so, you know, fa let's fast forward through this scenario. Okay. I tell them you'll, you're going to hear from my lawyer. Yeah. And then every time I see them, there's yes, something. and there's this and, thing, and, and I'm probably not going to win because it's probably not that big of a deal to criminal justice sure. or a judge. You know, I've gone to judge. The other thing, I've I've sued people. I sued one person before. He, I was sitting in my car and just in a parking lot, and he ran into me. Oh, you've told me about them. I didn't know you sued, but you told me that that happened. Yeah, he he uh, he he ran into me and ripped my bumper off of my Honda Civic wow. and he promised he would pay because obviously it's his fault. I'm sitting in a parking <laughs> lot he, and he like for a half an hour just sitting in my car talking to someone and all of a sudden boom. He not, so, so he says, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'll pay for it. And I'm like, yeah. So he gives me information. I don't call the cops. Fast forward a year. He says, I'm not paying for it. Wow. And then, so I took him to small claims court. We go to court a year after that. Because it t takes that long. Right. And then he, uh, in court, long story short, I demonstrate that, and it was kind of down to the wire. Like the judge almost said, almost threw the case out. Wow! Because because the the other guy was claiming that I had pulled into the my the parking spot kind of at an angle. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And um, long story short, uh, I I heard the judge saying things was like, oh my god, the judge is believing this crap. One, they're believing it, and how self-serving is that story? And two, like that doesn't matter. I could be parked in the middle of the of you know of the parking lot in no space. That doesn't give you the right to, to run ram in. into you. Yeah, like it doesn't <laughs> matter how I was parked, you know. Right. But anyway, so then I lost faith in judges because I'm like, I can't even believe you're entertaining this shit. So then I win, and then he doesn't pay. He refused. Oh my god! So then it takes another year. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ever going to see this money. And then I think I threatened to take him back to court. And then he paid me. Guess how much money uh, I was even asking for? A thousand bucks. Four hundred dollars. Four hundred was a three year process. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. So so anyway, like so I'd been to court before, and I and I've you know experienced the nonsense of it all. Yeah. And I'm thinking, one, how much am I going to sue this person? I'm probably not even going to win, or it's going to be super aggravating. So Did I just cost you money, by the way. No. Okay. I mean, you know, it just. I mean, it could have because I sold the house, and you know, you could argue that it shaved. No, no, I meant the lawsuit you were talking about, the the one you sued. Oh no, I, okay. you know, small claims. You oh, don't okay. you don't need a lawyer. Blah blah blah. Anyway, my point is, is that um, we are. Uh, we were, we're far afield from the topic. Let's get back. Sure. Well, well, let's let's take a you break. Were, the, sorry, yeah, let's take a break. But then I know what you were talking about. Well, what was I talking about? Like how people don't understand that the lower people, the people at the lower uh, levels of income, really have very little. So any any chance they have at a better life, they jump at it. Right, and that our society is set up to essentially keep them at a lower yes. life and force them to go into yeah. denial about such things like pyramid schemes and, and the lottery. When we get back from the break, let's talk about whether or not Nexium was a cult or not. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. Okay, we're back from the break. If we were to divine or design a pyramid scheme regarding how to make people become patrons, how would we design that? Well, basically, you know, obviously the first few people you get to meet us and then plan episodes with us and go on a secret vacation to an undisclosed location. And there we will tell you the true secret behind not only our podcast, but uh, well, less said the better, but you'll find out. And then you will be entitled by participating in asking 10 or more of your friends and all they have to do is a small up upfront donation of you know ten to hundred bucks, uh, unless they're feeling like they really want to learn more secrets, and then they will be entitled in turn to ask ten or a hundred or a thousand of their friends, and so forth. <laughs> wow, that could work. All right. So was it a cult, Berto? What do you think? 
I, 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 I do believe some aspects of Nexium were cultish, and certainly the offshoots, including the, the this thing that they formed, uh, the sex cult that was not all of Nexium, but it was like an offshoot, were cultish. But I think that you know there were some big names that got sort of tangentially involved with this Nexium thing, up to and including the Dalai Lama apparently, <laughs> and so. I think that there was some part of it, like happens in a lot of these cases, where, okay, yeah, I have some some wisdom to impart and I'm going to charge money for it. What's so wrong about that, right? And then there were the parts where uh, it, it was pyramidy because you were it was high pressure and you needed to recruit more and questionable claims about what you will the benefits you will actually reap. And then they started doing the similar thing that Scientology did. First of all, they were trying to become a religion at one point. Oh, really? Yeah, because you know it worked brilliantly for Scientology. And two, they realized that they needed to recruit influencers like Scientology recruited influencers and influencers typically like Hollywood or big stars and celebrities because if you can get them, that attracts a whole host of new people and influencers attract more influencers. So that was something, kind of another potential red flag with these kind of things. Yeah. So the definition of a cult, people love to, on the internet, I've realized, talk in ways of absolutism regarding the definition of a cult. Mm -hmm. They'll say like, this is a cult and this is not a cult. And I see like, we've done a number of episodes, you know, a handful of episodes on quote unquote cults and yeah. other, other kinds of, you know, the Rajneeshis right. on Scientology and other kinds of things. And I'll throw out questions, you know, like is, is for example, Jehovah Witness, are they, are they a cult? And rabid responses on the internet, absolutely <laughs> a cult. And I find that it's a similar discourse when I ask questions like, is this person a psychopath? Sure. Like we did an episode on whether or not Logan Paul was a psychopath, right? Right. And many people on the internet are like, obviously he's a psychopath. Duh. <laughs> and, and the what I find is essentially what they're, what they mistake because they, everyone knows a psychopath is, is bad, right? right? They're like, you associate psychopathy with bad. You associate cult with bad. Right. And so I think what they're doing is they're, it's a value judgment and they, they don't have the refined language or critical thinking skills to uh, really expand on what they mean. What they mean is uh, Nexium is bad. Uh, yeah. or, or Jehovah Witness to me was bad. But cult, one, there is no decided consensus definition of what a cult is. Right. It's just a word like, like what is rock music? There's no definition. You know, you could say a band is rock one, you know, is, is, uh, are the Beatles rock? Right. You know, some people <laughs> would say, yeah, absolutely. It's rock. Cause it's, it's, you got a snare in the two and the four. And it, you know, has guitars and other people are like, no, that's not rock. That's like, I don't know. It's just like easy listening or blues or something, you know, like. There's right. A Anyone could claim that it's at most what you could do is you could pull a thousand people and look at what's the average set of responses right. and be like, okay, these types of things land in the rock category. <laughs> or or they're, you know, this thing is a 62% sure, likelihood yeah. of. So it's a similar thing with cult. You know, there's no many people have thrown out different definitions and with psychopathy, for example, we actually have a definition. There are people qualified to make such determinations, but people are like, Oh, Logan Paul's a psychopath. And it's just right. like, and, and then they, and if they do have data, it's essentially like he's a menace to society. And it's like, that's not the definition of a psychopath. Right. Uh, there, most people who are menaces to society are not psychopaths. So, you know, you're just a menace to society. Anyway, so, but there there are some definitions of a cult that I find to be um, useful. And so let's just go over one of these models and okay. line by line, the criteria decide whether or not Nexium is a cult. Absolute authoritarianism without meaningful accountability. Nexium? Yep. H how do you know? Uh, there is an undisputed, unquestioned head of the group and there and it's not up for like vote or renewal or it's not yeah not, someone else isn't going to get promoted to that position <laughs> right and again without meaningful accountability meaning that 
But that's a harder thing to evaluate given our sure. va- given our vantage point. I mean, there could have been accountability within the organization, but yeah. the little bit that I've seen, it seemed like there wasn't. Like, there's this leaked video of these members sort of pushing back on him a little bit. Well, and, and right, and, uh, and he's saying like, "No, I'm right. You're wrong." Absolutely. And um, the I'm reading here that the uh, the training itself, you had to sign non disclosure agreements. Right, so that that's kind of like uh, same thing with Scientology and stuff. Like, hey, listen, you can't talk about any of this outside of here. Right now, that's true in a lot of companies, right? At least like you can't, you know, you work for a company, and like you know, I, I work at a company where I'm not supposed to discuss exactly how we tattoo people, but I can talk about the designs of the tattoos. So that's true in a lot of companies. You don't, you can't discuss freely everything about what you were working on doing. But one difference is, like in this case. Uh, when we're talking about accountability, if, you know, if, if the, if the thing, the training methods are violent or abusive and things like that, you've already signed like what you think is a legally binding document where you can't even talk to your like relatives about it. Right. Right. Well, there's a big difference between a non-disclosure regarding trade secrets, like, you know, Coca-Cola formula and non-disclosure about anything you're doing. Right. Alcoholics Anonymous, you have an agreement that you're not going to talk about other people in the group right. so that people feel safe when they go to groups to say whatever they want to say. But no one in Alcoholics Anonymous says you can't talk about what you learned right, or right. what happened in general. Like yeah. people did this and this has happened. You're just not supposed to talk about people's names. Whereas, you know, anyway, okay, number two, uh, no tolerance for questions or critical inquiry. Um, we've already kind of answered that one. No meaningful financial disclosure. Do you know anything about that one? No, but no, I don't. Yeah, but we, we don't know. We don't have data. I don't know if they if they made public. Uh, unreasonable fear about the outside world. What do you think? Fear? Yeah. I don't know if that's what they taught. Yeah. Not I fear. I don't know. You know, that that's common to, say, David Koresh. David Koresh? Well, Scientology has fear of psych- psychology. Right. Right, so that's essentially like an alternative to what their model is providing, so, yeah. Well, and actually, they do kind of do this, you know, in Scientology, they do the thing where like, hey, anyone telling you otherwise is a repressive or whatever they right. call it, and like, oh, don't talk to those people. You gotta not talk to your family, you gotta like, so in that sense, and so I don't know how much of that was true about Nexium. Right, uh, doesn't seem like it, you yeah. know, because they, they seem to be kind of in the world, you know, Sure, but who knows. Um, Rajneeshis were very much like this. Like when they went to Central Oregon, they were in a massive, violent, deadly con- yep. conflict with locals. And that's a very good way, if you do it right, to create extreme cohesion and obedience with, within your small cult. Because there's the, you know, the rest of the world is, is your enemy and is aggressive against you. Right. And you can all, you sort of force to depend on each other. Uh, so it's a very effective cult tactic. Uh, here's another one. There's no legitimate reason to leave, and former followers are always wrong for leaving. Is that true about Nexium? I I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. Having listened to interviews of former members, they will say that that yeah. um, you know, I mean, not horrible like in say the Koresh uh, cult or no. or I don't know uh, Manson cult, but it was. Uh, narrativized as because people would leave you know you could freely just drop out but they were labeled as like they don't really get it they're they're missing out you know all that kind of stuff uh former members often relate to uh, former members often relate the same stories of abuse and reflect a similar pattern of grievances is this true about yeah there were a lot of similar stories from ex-members Right. So this is really the key. Like you really have to rely on former members to tell you what's really happening. You know, people yep. who left and uh, whether they liked it or not. I mean, there. so there's a lot of interviews with people who didn't like the, like Nexium and they will, they will talk shit about it. But there's even people who have come forward and said, actually, I benefited from Nexium. Sure. The yeah. classes helped me. I, you know, I grew, I learned about myself. I learned a lot of good tips. I met right. a lot of good people. But there were some weird aspects to it, and I left. Yeah. And here were the weird... I heard about these other things, and, 
you know, yeah, there was... And that's true of Scientology, too. Right, yeah. exactly. It's very... I, I wonder if uh, Ranieri was like, I want to... I want to create Scientology too. Well, from what I read slash heard, watched, yes, because like I said, it, it seemed like he was uh, impressed with what Hubbard had been able to pull off. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, but it, it's possible, and of course, we could only speculate at this point, that he was like, okay, Scientology was very effective, but Hubbard made some mistakes. Right. He had some wackadoo things about Xenu and, <laughs> and, you know, energies that don't, can't really be substantiated by empirical science. And he also was a bit of a creep. And, um, you know, so I'm going to create a different, you know, a very similar thing to that. But and I'm, not be a creep. <laughs> but, but, I'm, but, and for many years he succeeded. Like yeah. the, the sex cult wasn't until later. Right. Of seemingly. Yeah. So he, he, he seemingly succeeded for a long period of time. Um, let's see. There are records, books, news articles, and broadcast reports that document the abuses of the group or leader. Is that true? Well, yeah. I mean, there are accounts from people like concerned about their relatives. Like there was a, a rich dude whose daughters were, had given like millions of dollars and were like really emotionally dependent on the group and things like that. So I don't I don't know if that sort of counts as well. In that yeah, portion. I mean there were brands they branded the girls. Oh yeah, if we're talking okay, if we're talking about the subgroup, uh, whatever it was called. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, all of the above. Oh okay. Yeah, but I'm talking about just like Nexium itself. Right. I guess that's a good distinction because yeah, because, because a lot of people I think in you know if you're just passively paying attention to the news you're probably just like. The entire organization of Nexium was a sex cult, which which isn't true. Oh, it was DOS, D O S, or the Vow. Yeah, we're gonna get into right. that in a second. That, so that if we get to that, that's like full yeah. wackatoo. <laughs> uh, the last three criteria here are followers feel they can never be good enough. Do you think that that's? I true? don't know if that's true. Yeah, hard to know. The group or leader is always right. Yeah, that seems the case. <laughs> yeah, the group or leader is. The exclusive means of knowing truth or receiving yep. validation. Yes. Yeah. So, so it seems that there are some strong indications of cult according to this model, which I think is a good model, but also some not so much. You know, yep. Nexium was definitely had cult qualities, but when you look at something like the Manson family or the Koresh cult or the um, Branch Davidians or Jonestown, yeah. you know, these these people were, uh, had all the qualities in spades. Yeah, like a little more on the extreme side. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's just, to me, so interesting and weird that we just have continual repetitive uprisings uh, or occurrences of these cults, even in today's internet world, that a, a cult like this you know, the small, especially the small sex cult could still exist right. in, in today's world. It's just so interesting to me. Yeah, it's very interesting. 30 years ago, 100 years ago, particularly 500 years ago, makes total sense. How are, how are you supposed to know anything? Sure. How are you supposed to data check? How are you supposed to find a way out? Yeah. But today, it's just so interesting that like these things still exist. And I think that, uh, which we'll get into as to why, because uh, it might... So some people, they're like, why would you even get involved and why wouldn't you just walk away? We'll get into why it's, it was hard for these women to walk away. Um, and it just points to how we need to educate people about this sort of thing. Right. I mean, how many high school students are taught about cults? Oh, absolutely. And, and zero. <laughs> but also, we, and I'm sure we'll bring this up, but not everyone is susceptible to falling into a cult. And it's unfortunately the people that have already had uh, some abuse inflicted on them that are at a higher risk for falling into those kinds of things. Right. We've debated this before. I have a new way of talking about this. Before, I was trying to convince you that everyone was vulnerable and that often there's this myth. Oh, right. I, I forgot about that debate. <laughs> yeah. Often, peop often there's this myth of just like, well, they must be weak. You know, they won't say that word but they essentially are saying that sentiment. And I will say that 
I agree but disagree. And here's the way I would state it is that everyone is susceptible to cult indoctrination. And there's countless examples of of us being essentially indoctrinated into a way of thinking that totally is is critically problematic. Um, and there's a gradation of susceptibility, you know, depending on the things that you identified. Yeah. The abuse, loneliness, lack of self. Uh, well, and, and by the way, just a quick parenthesis. I just now didn't say, and they're the only ones that would fall for this kind of thing. I, I specifically think of it as risk factors, you know, like, and so I'm proposing raise, that there are risk factors. Raise your risks. Yes. And anyone under the right circumstances, right. like if all of your friends and all of your family uh, were in a cult yeah. and your town, half of your town was in a cult and you were afraid Yep. of this or that, then what else are you going to do? It's just like the, we're not independent minds. No. You know what I mean? It's we're, we're 99% society and 1% individual. Yeah. People love is in America love to think of us as like a hundred percent individual. And it's just like, just look at the way you dress for crying out loud. <laughs> like you are not an individual. <laughs> um, so uh, and I want to plug Open Minds Foundation. I've had John Atak on a number of episodes about cults. Open Minds Foundation, of which I'm on the advisory board, helps to educate people about cults and helps to actually get people out of cults. So if you're interested in learning about how to be a helper and how to be a therapist to help people get out of cults or even get on their referral list, go to Open Minds Foundation. Okay, so let's go into... Keith uh, uh, Ray, Rainieri. It's such a weird last name because it's spelled like Rainier. Yeah, like, that's like, what I thought it was. Like yeah. Mount Rainier. Rainier. But it's spelled okay. Rainieri. Okay, and that's it's it's pronounced Rainier. Hard to say. Um, so let's go over his, his personality here. Um, to me, well, how would you describe his personality based on all this stuff that you saw? He talks nerdy but well, meaning, uh, yeah, I watch videos of him plugging his, what was it, consumer byline? Uh, consumer yeah, consumer byline. byline. I, I watched vi old '80s videos of him kind of talking about that, and it, wow, he was even like he seemed like a little like computer geek or something like that. Yeah, but he talked well enough, and he certainly sold the idea well enough. And in more recent videos, which are way more polished and all these things, now he looks just more like what I would call a new age nerdy kind of guy. But he does talk interestingly you know he says and you know like the words that come out of his mouth don't immediately trigger me like whoa what the hell is he talking about they sound intelligible enough and like okay well empowerment that's a good word and and so uh, that's obviously how his front is is appealing because he's you know not the best looking guy in the world he's not super athletic or famous in any other way but he can talk well and right. so I think he, he opens with a good story. <laughs> okay. What about his personality, though? But, you know, then on that sense, it seems like he is very sure of himself. He has unrealistic high self-image in some regards. Uh, it sounds like he... Meaning, as an example of the IQ... The IQ story plus the fact of what he feels that means because when 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 that's one of the videos i saw and things like it seems like the implication is that he has reached some levels of understanding previously unprecedented right right yeah and, and that's a high self opinion right yeah like not just hey i'm pretty good at helping like you look at tony robbins you don't hear tony robbins like hey, I'm the first man in history to have broken the code of life, right? He'll say things like, I'm just, I discovered that I'm pretty good at grabbing someone that's down on their luck and helping them see a different way or whatever, right? And yes, he'll charge you a lot of money, but he's transparent about like the type of thing he's trying to do. In this case, it's like, I've discovered things that no one else has and it's it's and you have to dive really deep with me for you to find out the things i found out and so that takes a whole other level of self-belief yeah and so very, that's very similar I, to l ron hubbard exactly yeah so i think he's either self-deluded or at least just able to convince himself and others of these grandiose 
stories. Right. So that's the key is was he a very good marketer and knowingly adopted a grandiose, unrealistic position to make money and right. to influence other people? Or did he actually believe it? Right. And this is the question that I want everyone to really have in their mind when they're looking at people on the internet or famous people like Donald Trump or like Logan Paul is that you can't know the answer to that question unless that individual willingly participates in an assessment ongoing with someone who knows how to distinguish those two things. Right. Because it's possible that Ranieri was just very shrewd at knowing like, well, I don't really believe I have all the answers, but if I act like I have all the answers, then I'm going to make more money. Yeah. And when you create a capitalist system and a culture that values making money and being having prestige and you know blah blah blah, having nice cars and planes and everything, then people are going to find all sorts of weird ways to make it up their ladder, and they're going to use the strengths that they have. And it could be a mix, like in the movie, the smartest guys in the room, the Enron story. Yeah, uh, it's clear, like you know. Here's people that had who, a... Who actually also were involved with Keith Raniere. Oh, yeah. I read that. That's a crazy connection, one of the, actually. The, like the CEO of, of Enron was one of his customers. One of the... Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe there's a... Well, that's a signal there. But I mean, the, the thing I was getting at is here's a, a group of people that are have a high self or high self-image and they believe they're, they are the smartest guys in the world kind of thing. But then they start acting that way and then they start having success. And so then that makes them actually kind of validates their theory. So whether or not initially it was like bravado, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I guess I am the smartest guy. And look at all this money I'm making. Right. And then it, and then it could just snowball from there. Totally. So therefore, these cult leaders that start actually having hundreds, thousands of people telling them, you are the savior of humanity. Yeah. Well, maybe I am the savior of humanity. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. So... Which, again, is another tick in the evidence uh, on the column that we are social beings and not individuals as right. much as we think we are. You can create narcissism in people by their circumstances. Yeah. Um, so the traits that I, I find that Keith Raniere had was like thousands of other people that we have seen in popular media or in other kinds of positions – he has the following traits. Number one, he has charisma. Yeah. And this is all in the uh, narcissistic uh, psychopathy spectrum area. Yeah. Uh, what I would call low-grade, quote-unquote, functional narcissism and psychopathy. Yeah. Uh, you and I are on that spectrum. Right. As we've talked about before. Uh, in order to feel like you have enough interesting things to say to create a podcast... You have to have some, you have to be on that spectrum, you know, at least at the 5% level. Uh, you also have to be a little bit psychopathic in that you're willing to break society rules and you're willing to maybe incur disapproval from other people, you know, right? and, uh, the, and live outside the sort of normal uh, lines of life that, that most people feel like they want to conform to. So, so he, uh, Keith Raniere is definitely on this spectrum in terms of my conceptualization. He has charisma. He knows how to create buzz around him. He knows how to make others feel as though they're benefiting from his guidance. Right. Um, he knows, you know, how to quote unquote manipulate other people. And I use manipulate in the not judgmental term in terms of like, he's just very good at knowing like what makes people tick and knowing in order to create a group like this, you know, prior to the sex cult thing, you just have to know how to push people's buttons, you yeah. know? So as he's talking to people and he's providing guidance, he's, he's, he's realizing like, ooh, when I do this or when I say this, people really respond to that and they want more of it. Yeah. And so he was, you know, he's just really good as that. And, you know, as I was saying, met most people who are on the spectrum like this, who are lower on the spectrum, they don't do any harm. Like I said, podcasters are like right. this in general. Um, they could be salespeople. They could be politicians. Uh, every politician is also on this on this <laughs> spectrum. There's no way right. you could be a politician without a dash of narcissism and a dash of psychopathy. Uh, it's just not possible. Um, community organizers, professors, professors. Take it from me. I've worked with lots of professors. <laughs> They're all on the spectrum. They love <laughs> to talk. 
They love to <laughs> listen to themselves talk. They think their ideas are great. And that's what you want in a professor. You don't want a professor who's like insecure about- Don't take it from me. Yeah, I don't know anything. <laughs> um, in fact, those professors who actually are like that quickly end up being fired or drop out or get burnt out because one, students don't respond to them very well. Two, they come across incompetent. And three, they can't really put up with the BS of being a professor because- they don't really care about coming across as smart to other people. Yeah. There's a reason why people on the narcissistic psychopathic spectrum are attracted to podcasting or teaching is because you get a, get a spout about bullshit like I'm doing right now. <laughs> so, but given what we found later about Keith Ran Ranieri, God, it's so hard to say his name. Um, there's, there's something different <laughs> about his personality that is beyond the regular yeah. low grade spectrum. Uh, he has, it, but it's hard to know what that was. Right. Uh, it could be sadism. There's an actual, we don't have it in the DSM anymore, anymore, but it is. it exists in reality. Just because it's not the DSM doesn't mean it doesn't exist, which is sadistic personality disorder. Where he like gets off on others' pain. Right. He branded people. Why the hell would you do that? He had, he had, I mean, this is now, now we're starting to get into a little nitty gritty here. He had a set of women that were blackmailed and and coerced to begin with now them themselves holding down other women to brand with a hot iron right <laughs> right so you and i no matter how hard up we were for that kind of attention are not capable of doing that kind of thing one i mean we're capable of doing it i guess if we were sort of forced into it somehow but have no desire i don't have any desire to do that kind of thing, like it wouldn't, it would hurt my feelings to watch other people going through right. pain. Just, plus, just do tattoos. Plus, I would not want to have a gaggle of people around me who I was suspicious that they secretly hated me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, that doesn't, I hate it when I'm around people at work who I suspect might be neutral about me. Like, right. I'm like, I think that person's neutral about me. That's making me uneasy. I got yeah, yeah, yeah. to get them to like me. <laughs> so I can't imagine having like a whole sex slavery cult where there's a good possibility they all hate me. You know, yeah. that's a particular kind of personality where you get off. You, you Unbelievable. Have, so you, you actually, essentially the way to look at it is one, you have enough psychopathy where you don't really care about other people's feelings. And you have a pretty good uh, amount of sadism in that you're, because he's smart enough, you know, he is a 270 IQ. <laughs> he's smart enough to know if this gets out, he's going to jail. Right. He's not a dumbass. But why would you risk that in the world of, right. of what? the internet? <laughs> and, and, and he actually, you know, why would you risk that? Unless there was some massive rocks he was getting off. Well, because to be clear, why would you risk that when you have a shit ton of money already? So with the meaning, and what right. does shit ton of money buy you? Well, a ton of stuff. Right. And, and including, do you want to get prostitutes? Fine. Do you want to just get really hot women that, that love you because you're amazing, because you have this next thing, or because you have money or all of the above? Right. You can. <laughs> right. That's always the kicker. It's like, right. if you already have money and power and women, why would you do this? Right. Uh, you know, when we were talking about Bill Cosby. Right, right. Very similar thing. At the height of his powers in the late 60s, early 70s, he was a hot, you know, rich, famous, connected, respected, you know, successful, beloved human being in our country. He could have and probably did have sex with whoever he wanted to consensually. Women I have no doubt worth throwing themselves at him yeah. back, back then. And yet, even back then, you know, before he was older, like he was in his 20s and, and in the 60s when free love and sex was like, was like a thing. Ra rampant, <laughs> he was drugging women yeah. and making them unconscious and raping them. Right, which, which pointed, as we talked that time, that the desire must have been not just about the end goal. <laughs> right, which people yeah. confuse. They're yeah. like, oh, this is about having sex. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's about sadism. As, as, and control. And, yeah. yeah. As scary as it is, there are people out there who have you know, a wire crossed or a complex that creates a tremendous amount of pressure and even compulsion to 
overpower people in a certain way. And in order for it to be authentic to them, the person has to authentically be against it. Yeah. You know, they can't, you can't just role play that. Yeah. You have, the person actually has to feel pain and be scared yep. and be controlled. And there are people who get off on that. And that's, that's scary. It's very rare though. Right. That, that's why I want to point out that, that the vast majority of people on the narcissism psychopathy scale don't have this trait. Sure. Right. Cause, and they don't do this. That's why we don't have millions of Ted Bundy's running around or millions of Keith Ranieri's. Yeah. Right. Oh, by the way, in a very small example of roots of pot potential roots of potential sadism. Uh, so I don't know if I've talked about this before, but when I was little, I was five, I think uh, I was living in the East coast and we went at one of my friend's house. Uh, we went down to his basement because he had Star Wars toys there and stuff like that. And it was one of those old house basements where it's not finished, right? And you have these long, creepy stairs you got to go down. God, I, I don't know where this story is going, but I'm already scared. <laughs> I mean, right. you, you got you started out with sadist sadism yourself. Yes. You're talking about age five. You're talking about Star Wars toys down a down a creepy stairs <laughs> into a basement on the East Coast. I'm envisioning like Amityville horror. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's just it, dude. So one of these times, and I remember this so vividly. Think about how many memories you have at five, right? Not that many. I remember so vividly. We're downstairs, and all of a sudden. The lights go off and I think flicker and go off and we hear this horrible like screechy sound and we see this flowing robes at the top of the stairs and we are screaming and it was his grandma scaring us. Now, we are five and this grandma is for some reason scaring us like to death. Yeah. So that left a huge impression. And you know what ended up happening? When I got a little older, I, I remember having this desire to scare my, my, my little cousin. And it was like, oh, I want to scare. But of course, I never talked about it consciously in my head about, oh, because this happened to me. But now in retrospect, I, over the years, I've thought, oh, I had this desire to inflict that same feeling on someone else. Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up. I don't think I've ever thought about this before because sadism really isn't my thing. And I, I don't know if I've ever treated anyone with sadism. I've certainly assessed them before. But the uh, conceptualization that's sort of emerging in me right now, which is consistent with my other personality disorders, is that there's a spectrum, right? And that at lower ends of the spectrum, uh, you're... you're, you're because all of us have done sadistic things. Right. All of us have um, tortured a slug or pushed someone down just because we wanted to or... Or, you know, held the car battery to someone nuts or yeah. waterboarded. You know, we've all done these things. Spe especially when you look <laughs> at people who had younger siblings, like my little brother, th there was... I, I, it, I can't, it's just the most worst thing in my mind. And I've apologized to my brother like 20 times about it as an adult. And he keeps saying either it's fine or he doesn't remember it happening. But boy, do I remember it happening. I went through this phase where maybe two or three times, I was probably like 12 or something, maybe 13. I don't know, maybe younger. And I would tell my little brother, it's classic. I would go, no one loves you. Everyone hates you. Oh. Why don't you eat some worms? <laughs> and at first he would say, what? You know, it'd be, and I'd, and I'd have, I'd have to kind of convince him, yeah. you know, mom and dad don't love you. And he'd start crying. Oh my God, that's so evil. <laughs> but then I would hug him, but then I'd hug him and I'd say, no, everyone loves you. I love you. Mom yeah. and dad love you. And he would stop crying. And you, you got, your enjoyment was out of that moment where you got to rescue him or about the moment where you were tricking him? You know, I have no idea. It's hard to remember. I definitely enjoyed making him feel better Yeah. Uh, because I didn't like him suffering. Right. But what the hell? Yeah, right. You know? And, you know, <sighs> so so you think about like, okay, where did I get that from? Was Did that just emerge in me naturally? Or because now I'm thinking about it, it's like, I was bullied lightly by some older kids at school. Oh, okay. Who actually, actually, when I think about it, there was this other kid who, this much older kid, 
who f- like physically terrorized me and and said oh. and said similar things. Oh, like, that's horrible! Like no one loves right. you. Everyone hates you. You're doomed. so that set a pattern in your head. Maybe I mean it, you know it's no way to know empirically, but the the conceptualization I have is that we're all capable of sort of dipping into that spectrum. Right. And the more sadism we experience and the, the more psych, 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 psychopathic behavior is uh, done to us and the more neglect we have and the more neurologically, genetically we're susceptible to this kind of personality, um, the more likelihood we're going to exhibit that mm. sort of thing. And, and that uh, you can have a 5%. Because in my head, I kind of considered it a binary. You're, you're, you're a sadist or you're not. Right. But I think, you know, there's, there's probably a spectrum there as well. Keith Raniere clearly was fairly high on the spectrum, but not high, not as high as, say, Charles Manson or something, because he Keith Raniere waited until he was, you know, well into his life and career, yeah. like he was like in his fifties or something. By the time he started doing the more severe sex cult right. and stuff, you know? yeah, there's no stories that I've heard of him you know, abusing people and things like that when he was young. Or may, they might exist, but but that hasn't come out. Right. So getting back to uh, this extra. So again, he's on the, he's clearly on the narcissism psych- psychopathic right. scale. And to me, the thing that differentiates him from all, from us and all the other people that are kind of on that scale is he's very high. He's probably very high in the scale because um, you like, just take, for example, the IQ thing. Yeah. Um. I don't know about you, but I have uh, also, I'm cringing as I'm about to say this, bragged about my IQ at times. I see. And and been very interested in knowing my IQ. I see. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and uh, was very happy at the result and very braggy about right, the result. Right, right, right. Um, it was years ago. I haven't, I, to yeah. my memory, I haven't done that, in, I guess, until now. It's sort of a humble brag what I'm doing right now. But the point is, is that... Uh, you know, there are certain markers, you know, Donald Trump, for example, right. Talks about, he's a genius. Yeah. yeah. Know, there's just certain markers that you can just kind of tell anyway. Um, so, but what's different about Keith Raniere is that he has either sadism or he has such a severe case of what we call cluster B personality, which is narcissism, antisocial, histrionic, borderline, right. uh, due to potential relational trauma, uh, meaning that, if he has significant abandonment issues from his childhood, like significant abandonment issues, what can happen to you is you're so desperate for people not to leave you that you will resort to a lot of weird sorts of things. Mm, interesting. And, one of the, and you could imagine that for him, as he starts to age and maybe starts to get insecure or worried that women are going to leave him, yeah, okay, and he really needs that attachment security, that he you know, goes down a slippery slope of, of kind of testing the waters and cause the people were so loyal to him right. that he was like, well, I could really, you know, like L. Ron Hubbard, for example, had this condition. Mm-hmm. There were, in my estimation, based on the limited reports I've heard is that he would, upon being rejected or demeaned in some way, would lock himself in his room for days crying. Oh, wow. Like he was a very highly suffering individual. This is what happens when you have significant relational trauma and you're in the cluster B area, a little bit of rejection, even just false perceived rejection will cause your ego to crumble because just below that surface of grandiosity is a vast abyss of loneliness and horribleness. Whoa. The kind that you really only experience when you're like one or two or three years old. You know, you've seen young children, when their ego plummets, they plummet hard. Right. You know, they, nothing can soothe them. They're upset and irrational uh-huh. and flopping around. The, the, it, it, but it's handleable because they're two years old. They can't do much damage. And you can just, you know, control them and say like, well, you're going to, you know, you'll recover. And they do. But when you're an adult and you go through that, you lock yourself in a room and you oh, cry wow. yourself, you know. And so it's possible that Keith Raniere, I didn't see any evidence of this, but it's possible that he had this condition. And so it led him to, out of desperation, to create this sex cult as a mm. way of, tr- of, of controlling his relationships to the effect of like, 
you know, creating tons of validation for him. Right. You know, he's Guaranteeing that they, they wouldn't leave him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's get into uh, the history here uh, just real quick here. Yeah. So he's uh, born 1960. So he's, he's almost 60 years old now. Um, his father was an advertising executive. So that's maybe where he learned Interesting. about that kind of stuff. Um, Age 30, 1990, after taking an Amway marketing class, he founded Consumer Byline. Oh, it was 1990. Okay. Yeah. It's funny how I think of the of 1990 and above as like a totally different era than 89 and below. Yeah. But videos from 1990 look exactly like videos from 85, you know? Right. Yeah, we tend to be like there's this demarcation line. Yeah. Like, so when I watched that video, I felt like it was from like 85. <laughs> right. Like there's a lot of things from the late 70s that we label as 80s. Yeah. Like Devo. Yeah. Like you, when, you th when you hear Devo, you're like, oh, 80s. Yeah. But actually there's, they had plenty of songs in the 70s. You know? Interesting. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, the, these weird commercials uh, and signs of narcissism at this point, he wanted to change the world. And, you know, he came across as this humble genius and the New York attorney general accused him of operating it as a pyramid scheme uh -huh. in the 90s, and he had to shut it down, but there were no charges. Skip forward to 1998. He's 38 years old, and he, he founds Nexim. Uh, these seminars, we've already talked about that. I watched some of his lectures, as you were talking about. They're fine. I mean, I, I, they don't appeal to me, but there was nothing nefarious about his lectures. Yeah, it doesn't... Because I have heard... I, you know, uh, recordings of uh, some other cults and things like that, where I'm immediately like bristling, like, oh God, that sounds really creepy. And that wasn't the case. I Like you're saying, it wasn't really something that I went like, oh man, I should get into this. But it was at the same time, not super creepy in that, in that way. Yeah. The little bit I watched it, he uses a lot of words and he's very calm and, and it looks you in the eye and is very convincing or con he seems convinced of what yeah. he's saying, but it's not, it doesn't come across as pressuring, but I was trying to detect as he was talking, yeah, what he's actually saying. Yeah. And that's an, that's an interesting skill that you'll actually see a lot of charismatic people do. You'll see religious leaders do this too. They, you're, you know, you're almost sort of hypnotized or lulled into this sense of, of fascination and obedience by the fact that they never say anything that your brain really rejects because they're just saying word after word, you know, like, let me try to emulate it a little bit, see if I can hypnotize you, Bruno. Um, life is like a box of chocolate. So life is difficult for so many people. Oh, wow. And there are answers out there, many uh -huh. answers. Some answers are better than others. Really? And people search for answers and searching for answers is a good thing. It oh. means it means that you're trying. And the key is is that we all just need to accept that process that answers are out there mm. and that you can achieve those things that you want to achieve. Wow. I've talked with lots of people about this and and found a lot of success. Take and, my money. Yeah. Do you know <laughs> Take what I mean? my money now. <laughs> I have said nothing. Can can I try I, let's see if I can do this. Okay. Um Life is so interesting. The final frontier. Yeah, it's it's the final frontier. And why don't you join my sex club? <laughs> is that too too forward? It's too fast, too soon? Where do I sign? <laughs> yeah, so you, you heard like, that was just off the top of my head. I said nothing. Right. I, I said nothing. But you do that enough to people who like to look at your face while you're talking or... Yeah are looking for answers and are somehow convinced, or you have a, a team of endorsements behind you that say these words are important, or people don't know how to use critical thinking skills around, well, wait, what is what exactly is this person saying? Right, you know? right, right. right. Um, well, and then there's the risk of, uh, in some cases, I know we, I think we had banned this topic, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll unban it temporarily. So we're sitting here listening to a Jordan P Peterson lecture. And in that case, he's using such literary, you know, layered language that it's even more obfuscated that sometimes he's maybe not saying too much. And, and if you question whether he's saying too much or too little, one of his followers might say, oh, you just don't understand it. And it's, you know, it's like when you're battling the beast, 
that's not just any beast. And I don't mean a beast metaphorically. I mean the real beast. Right. The beast in all those books. That's not just the beast that you saw in the movies. That's the beast at the end of the book. But not a fake book, a real book. Right. Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And one could argue that speaking in poetic, metaphorical, squishy terms isn't in and of itself evil or nefarious. It's a way that people talk. Yeah. You know, there's surreal movies that don't really have a point that people like to watch. But the key is, is at, at what, what are the, at what end, you know, yeah. what's, what's the effect of it? Does it lull people into obeying, obeying you and spending money and not actually improving their lives? Or does it inspire people to, right. to you know, and, and doesn't drain their bank accounts or cause them to cut off relationships with other people, you know? So, but he was very good at that. And that, to me, that's his style was, was he, yeah. he did a lot of stuff like that. Because as soon as you say something like, here are the three things you're supposed to do. Well, now you're open to, you know, critical inquiry. Try those three and it doesn't work. Now we're wondering what we paid for. Right. <laughs> so it became popular. Ne Nexium, uh, Stephen Cooper uh, from Enron, the CEO, uh, the founder of BET, Sheila Johnson, and the former U.S. Surgeon General, Antonio Novello. Wow. Lots of people. And, you know, so... And I'm guessing he, like with Tom Cruise, highlighted the fact that these big names were a part of it. Were they what they are after or before? They were... Were they already who they were? The, so it was former U.S. Surgeon General. Yeah, what I'm wondering is, like, did Nexium help them become greater? Uh, seemingly not in terms of what they're known for. I see. You know what I mean? Because Enron was before all that. And uh, BET, anyway. So, uh, but, you know, big names. Yeah. And again, as you pointed out during the seminars, they needed to call him Vanguard. Because like the more impressive, yeah. The more impressive thing to me is, uh, take Montessori schooling, for example. Yeah. You know, they, they have examples of very successful people that were educated in Montessori. Now, of course, you could say, well, there's examples of people that were educated not in Montessori that are very successful. But it's more impressive to me if you say, look, before this process, this person was normal. After this process, that's the person you know now. Then I'm like, okay, that might have been something to do with your, especially if they themselves say, yeah, dude, I totally credit this system over here. Uh, and, and so that's more impressive than just, hey, you know this famous person that was already famous? They joined for some time. <laughs> Thus is the conundrum of the celebrity endorsement. Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so people would report that during the seminars, there were these kind of odd rituals where they would do these huddles. Mm -hmm. They would clap at the beginning of the seminar. There, you had to, you know, not disclose what was happening. Mm. Um, and what I'm guessing is, is that at this point, uh, Ranieri became kind of intoxicated by what he was experiencing. So if you have issues growing up, which lead to the necessity of having narcissistic personality or psychopathy, but particularly nar narcissism, you need a constant supply of, of narcissistic supply. Mm. And imagine having, you know, thousands of people consider you to be this guru, essentially. Right. And you're able to get tons of money from them and tons of loyalty and get them to do things like clap at the beginning and call you Vanguard and... I'm sure there was tons of times where he would walk into a large seminar and everyone's, you know, clapping and crying about how great he is. Imagine what that would do to your ego, you know, how, right. if that's what you needed out of life. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what narcissistic people are like, is that because of issues growing up, they resorted early in life to coping with neglect and issues of mistreatment by propping up a false grandiose self as a way of distracting themselves from the pain and, uh, and emptiness that they have, they yeah. feel they have. And they learn that not only do they need to convince everyone else that they're the best person in the room, but they have to convince themselves because if they don't really believe it themselves, then they're, faced, they're, they're forced to face their emptiness mm, yeah. and, and terror. 
And it's terror. It's horrible. Like I said about L. Ron Hubbard, it, it, when he was forced to face his his true self, but when his narcissistic supply was challenged, he would lock oh. himself in a room for a few days and cry be, out of out of sheer em, emotional and ego obliteration, which which happens. And I've seen it. Um, I don't experience that myself, but I've seen people go through this. I've you know been with clients and other people in my life who have had their narcissistic supply or their borderline supply challenged and the bottom just falls out from underneath them. And so um, imagine you have those kinds of up, ups and downs, which I'm guessing Ranieri had, but protected the public from knowing about such a thing because mm -hmm. you become very good at protecting the public from knowing such a thing. And then all of a sudden you're getting more and more supply, more and more people. Well, it'd be very intoxicating because it helps his defense of the grandiose self to have all that supply. Yeah, totally. Which makes the stability of his personality so much stronger and uh, greater at um, keeping at bay the acknowledgement of his emptiness and, and inner terror. And so I'm guessing this is what happens to a lot of people like this at the head of cults is eventually you get kind of acclimated, hmm, you yeah. know, like eventually it's like, okay, I've had three years of, of these seminars. I, I need, I need more supply. Yeah. That, well, like that, what's next? Yeah. That, Cause that's the thing about when, when you have the need for a distraction, once you become habituated to something, it no longer distracts you. Right. So you need to get more, a higher level or some new novel version of the distraction or the, the narcissistic supply. And so I think that's, I think it was a slippery slope that led him to eventually having a sex cult. Right. Cause he, for many years, he was completely, uh, uh, you know, legit and was doing, there were some weird things, but there wasn't anything illegal and, and untoward yeah, right. seemingly, you know, he, he was kind of a dick to people and he mm -hmm. claimed he was the smartest guy on the planet. And you know, there, there were things that were yeah. odd about him. But there didn't seem to be any direct harm. But he wasn't being arrested for cult, yeah. for like sex slavery. <laughs> so then fast forward to 2003, and some people started looking into him. There was a Forbes article, Vanity Fair. Then, But, you know, didn't really put an end to it. Then actress Kristen Kr Kruick became a member. She was, the, uh, she was Lana Lang on Smallville. And then she recruited Allison Mack to join, uh, who Allison Mack played Chloe on, on Smallville. And Alice and Matt got really into it to the point where she actually moved to Albany, New York, to be near the headquarters. Hmm. So she wasn't just into Nexus. Yeah. She wanted to be like fully, Into, like that was yeah. her life. That yeah. became her life, yeah. And Keith Ranieri was so jazzed about this because this was not just someone who kind of liked it, like the Enron guy. This was someone who was into it yeah you know Allison, and she was known publicly right and she was you know yeah. smallville was a big show yeah to the point where do you know what my dog's name is mm. you don't know the name of my dog crypto krypton <laughs> uh what what's your dog's name chloe oh okay you didn't know the name of my dog i guess i didn't wow chloe because i always say hi to her as like, hey, how's it going? But I never say hi, Chloe. <laughs> She's never introduced herself. Is your dog named after Chloe? Yeah. Wait, so you were a big Smallville fan? No, I'll just oh. say this. An extended family member, Okay. their favorite show was Smallville, okay. and their favorite character was Chloe. Oh, okay. Because I was a very lightweight Smallville watcher. Like yeah, I watched too. a few seasons. I liked the first like five episodes and then I was like, oh, this is a soap opera. Yeah. That's kind of made for younger people. Yeah. You know? So I watched like two seasons and then I lost interest. But I have to say, Chloe was never one of my favorite characters. <laughs> yeah. So my dog is named after Allison Mack's character on Smallville, which is, uh, you know, interesting. Um, so... Now, this is surprising to a lot of people because they're like, well, you know, she had it all. She's an actress. But again, as we have talked about many times, anyone is vulnerable to a cult. And just because you're famous doesn't mean you don't have a lack of self. In fact, you might have a greater chance of ha lacking a self because right. the lack of self might have led you to narcissism and a need to be a star, which led you to be famous. And not again, not that every famous person has a lack of self, but anyway. Um, so skipping through. Yeah. So then eventually 2015 was when DOS was formed. It stands for, it, well, they speculate that it stands for Dominus Obsequious 
sororium, sororium which yeah. is m- basically means like master over slave women. Yeah. Reportedly, there were uh, there's a rotating group of fifteen to twenty women. Maybe a total of like fifty women had been in the in the group, and they would target young women, young attractive women who were seemingly going through tough times. They told them that it would, this is just so interesting to me. They told them these girls, these young women, it was a secret society, secret sorority yeah. that was only women. Yep. And if you join our secret Nexium sorority, there's camaraderie, there's uh, there, there's su- mutual support. It and was, new doors open up for you. Right. It just seems like if you're being invited into such a thing, totally. it, just, it just seems like, oh my God, sign it's me amazing. up. amazing, yeah. I mean, at the very least, it's like, well, I'll check it out. I mean, Allison Mack and like all these other famous people are in it. It's like, well, let's see, you know? So so one example, um, in my, my uh, tattoo company many years ago, uh, there was, um, I didn't used to, and now I own it, but many years ago, I was just an employee. And there was this system that they had in place called the bench and the bench was not well known in fact when i joined the company it was like i didn't know about it but then all of a sudden a few years in i started hearing hey uh there's this thing called the bench and like but it's like secret and some people are invited into it it's like for high performers and then you get all this extra training and stuff like that and i was like what and then one day my manager at the time told me that he had nominated me for this thing oh my god i felt so cool I'm like oh i'm invited into like this little secret society right well i went through the program it was like a two-year thing and let me tell you it was not very helpful <laughs> but i felt so special at first right and and yeah. of course if they if you know, granted i probably wouldn't have wanted to be branded but if they're like you know part of this things you got to get a tattoo or you gotta you know uh, you know for a one month, you got to get a special haircut or something. I probably would have done it because I felt so, so, you know, cool to be included in the secret thing. Right. This happens all the time. I mean, not necessarily secret societies, but sororities and fraternities, for example. Yeah. Being in a, a elite group at your work or something, you know, being a partner. Right. Being, being an associate, being a vice president. Uh, a very... Uh, easy example for me to point to that just pop in, into my head are the frequent flyer clubs, the lounges. Oh yes, in, in airports, and you walk by them, you're like, oh, I wish I was a member. Have you been in one of these? <laughs> no. Oh my god. So, a friend of mine is a frequent flyer, and I okay. and I went in actually when we were going down to Cuba, and the I, I always thought. The way people described it and the way it seemed from the outside, it was like, oh man, this is going to be glorious. It's like yeah. free food, free, right. free drinks. I always, I'm jealous. I walk by, I'm like, oh, I'm missing out on the good life. It is not glorious. <laughs> it is arguably, to me, not any, in fact. It's like a waiting area. <laughs> yeah, essentially. It's, and there's nothing in there that you can't get in the regular airport. There are free things. Okay. But they're not good free things because, you know, think about airlines. They don't have a ton of money to just throw around on stuff. You know, they're working on very tight margins, sure. very tight competition. They can't just be throwing tens of thousands of dollars away on like free food. Half of it will go bad because it's out. Do you totally. Know? And so the food was actually like, there were like really small nature bars and, yeah. you know, there was a place you could sit, but it just... I was like, oh, and I'm, I'm guessing there are some clubs that are better, you know. Sure, sure. But the point is, is that I still went in and I still felt special. Right. And when I walked out of there, my chin was a little higher, <laughs> you know. And and so, you know, there's just lots of examples like that. And, and so you can imagine it being uh, attractive. Now, there were many required. Do you know all that? So we've talked about branding, but what else do you know of that these women were required to do? So my understanding is they, they got compromise on all of them, meaning, you know, they would, uh, they would make sure to have compromising material that, that could be used against them later. If and that they included, spoke out or left. Right. And it was like naked photos, the branding ceremony and other things too. And like story, like they would be asked to disclose, self-disclose a lot of like secret stuff and yeah. Right. Exactly. So they would ask for a piece of collateral every month. Every month. Every month. Every month. And if they didn't give something good, <laughs> they would crazy. They would pressure them and say, if you don't give us something good, we're going to release the other things. 
You That's know? so, I mean, imagine how much stress your life becomes at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It, people would disclose criminal acts that they'd done, you know, like yeah. I shoplifted or I I did a hit and run one time, you know. So, or, so this is, uh, yeah, earlier I was comparing the pyramid scheme stuff to like the way a mo- the mafia operates, but it is interesting because uh, I've seen a lot of documentaries uh, where they interview ex-mafia members. And one of the things that's very common is they talk about the stress they always felt when they had this regular schedule. They were always supposed to kick back up some money. And the, the, the incredible stress they were always under. Because, you know, you have this kind of like romanticized notion of, oh, being in the mob and like the, the little Italian dinners they have and stuff like that. But in reality, just like these pyramid schemes, the people at the bottom are busting their ass every day trying to figure out what scam they can pull because they better have that money at the end of the month or whatever it is. It reminds me of this where it's like, holy shit, well, I got to do something crazy and photograph myself doing it. So if not, like all the other shit's going to get released. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. So that was, again, his, his, imagine devising that scheme. Yeah. And it should be noted that Allison Mack was seemingly a, a major part of this process. Yeah. It seems, obviously without having all the story, but it seems like, he really got in her head to begin with. So, like, you well, know. so that's the question is like, did he, which we don't, we might not ever know, but maybe as, as data comes out from her, we'll know more. But the narrative on the internet is like, so, so to back up a little bit, Allison Mack was the one who would recruit people into the group. She yeah. would actually seek people out. In fact, she sought out um, Hermione, uh, there's yeah. like there's like public tweets between them or something where she's trying to get Hermione involved. What's her name? Emma Watson. Emma Watson. I think. And she so Allison Mack would would find a woman and say you know would you know right. through her connections as an actress and would be like you should be in 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 our You'd secret be sorority. Very awesome for this thing. Yeah, and then and apparently Allison Mack was totally in love with Keith Raniere and was having sex with him all the time. That's by, by the way, what I mean by like, he, he really, before the cult started, he had basically really gotten in her head. Well, but the phrase you're saying got in her head is one possibility. Well, maybe you, maybe you think I mean it in a different way. I mean how, uh, like take the Manson family. Like there were different levels of, participate willing participation in that group and a couple of those women were fully in like fully in and so that's what i mean by like but in it, that but case it implies a passive stance when you know that a man got in her head that's the mm. na- that's the narrative she could have gotten in his head we just don't know oh no i okay i'm claiming without evidence that he had fully like convinced her of this right of his power and yeah. awesomeness you keep saying the same thing thinking i'm you're you, you, that it's not oh, what okay I'm i thought that you meant that i might have been meaning that he had like mind controlled her well or you're you're on you're in that direction but i'm not i'm saying so i'll use a different phrase he, he had he had like wooed her or something like <laughs> you keep I, I, maybe you're not understanding what i'm saying i'm saying the 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 spectrum of language you're using is he affected her. Clearly he did. But you don't know. We don't know. She that. moved there. She joined full. Like that, but clearly that, that narrative is very um, is biased based on a number of issues. One is he had power and she didn't. So it so it seems like she wouldn't participate meaningfully in that. And that could be true. Uh, the other is that he's a man and older and she's a helpless little woman. Well, I mean, the, the narrative that he sold her and everyone else in we, that we don't, group. We, but we don't know her motivation. We, it, it will come out. It's totally possible that 100% he influenced her, brainwashed her. She no, was, no, no. She, see, that's what I'm not saying brainwashed. Well, well, or much lesser than that, yeah, yeah. influenced her. It's also very much possible that she went into this quote unquote willingly and even might have even ingratiated herself in because she became basically a massive, she became the secondhand uh, person in this organization. She became I, a very powerful person. Okay, here's what I don't believe. And it'd be really hard to 
show me evidence that would prove this. That Allison Mack, for at least a few years ahead of this, had this desire to join some cult that she could get to the top of and convince the top to create a sex sorority. No, I don't think so. Right? But but it's <laughs> but a, a narrative that is possible. And again, it's not likely, but it's totally possible. She um, learns about Nexium. We know that. She loves the seminars. She meets Keith Ranieri and finds him to be compelling and actually benefits from his guidance. She falls in love with him. She has a relationship with him, romantic and sexual, that she finds to be mutually gratifying. Fast forward 15 years or however long it you know took 13 years or something for the sex cult to begin. Um, he starts to say, we need to expand our horizons or something. She, she could have even suggested it. We don't know. It's not likely. <laughs> but my point is, is that the way the, the media are reporting it, it's like they already know the narrative, which I find to be um, jumping the gun a little bit. It's possible. It's just a little bit of Occam's, Occam's razor because it's like on, the, on exhibit A, uh, we Occam have a serial entrepreneur who is specialized in convincing people to give him money and is extremely powerful at convincing very powerful individuals yeah. all the time. Yeah. On the other hand, we have it, an actress. It's just interesting <laughs> that you perceive me adding a question mark as not saying that. I'm not saying, so Occam's razor is not that the easiest answer is the answer. No, it's just that it's, it's, it's let's like, start with that. <laughs> it's likely the right yeah. answer, but that doesn't mean it is the right answer. We just don't know. But by the way, cause like, I'm not disputing her culpability in all this. I'm not, I'm not applying culpability. Okay. I'm saying none of us know, given what we have. It's because when he was arrested, she continued to defend him and was very upset about it. She sure. So now Stockholm syndrome same, people. Same thing with Manson, right? People Stockholm. Well, all of them. They camped outside and so, for years they they so defended him. The, the three women who we look at, yeah. each of them had a different kind of um, reaction upon Manson being yeah. arrested, and some of them, in my, I think one of them from my memory seemingly was just as much as a psychopath. Yeah, I agree. Okay. In all the interviews, it's like, okay, you are a psychopath. <laughs> right. That, that, now, it's hard to tell because yeah, I know, I know, we're I know. just watching interviews on the internet. But Allison Mack, you know, out of all the people who Nexium had attracted, yeah, it's possible that Allison Mack was just as much of a sadistic psychopath or just as much problematic or just as much like... Um, needy of some kind of organization like this as he was. We, right, we, but I would have said- And loved yeah. it just as much as he did. I, 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 sure, but I would have said the same statement about that one gal in the Manson case, that still it was, Ma Manson was still the person, the, the mastermind. And, oh, well, okay. I, 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 so yeah. it's possible, I'm not saying that's not true, right. Berto. I'm just saying you and I do not know the answer to that question until I'm guessing five, 10 years later from now, there's some interview with Allison Mack where she- convincingly tells the story of how she got into it. But there's some line, like for example, it is possible that uh, the Hermione was actually the one that started all of this. And that to cover her tracks, she faked some text message. Like this is possible, but that's extremely unlikely. Yeah, right. but it's not extremely it's unlikely. It's not as unlikely. <laughs> that that the other story that what you're... a wonderful logical <laughs> argument, bro. I'm so well, no, I'm, just I'm saying so there, convinced. Well, there must be a line, right? Like there's a line, and yeah. and you're saying you're comfortable keeping that line blurry where, you, where what you're bringing up. I'm saying you just like to jump to conclusions. I get it. Well, I'm saying that in my mind, the uh, even the little available evidence we have, my money would easily be on the Nexium dude. My money would be Ranieri. too. That see, this is what bugs me about people when I talk about question marks. Yeah, if I had if I had to put money on the line, I would bet for, on that too. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, I don't fucking know. In the same way that if I bet on the Super Bowl in you know coming up, I don't know who's gonna win, but I have a I have a guess as to who's gonna win. You know, especially if the odds are extremely likely of something happening. Yeah. That still doesn't mean you know what's gonna happen. Sure. We have a very high likelihood that uh, Allison um, Mac. 
uh, it, you know, a good portion of her motivation was because of, of coercion in general and fear and uh, Stockholm syndrome being sold a line, uh, you know, and then just kind of lost herself in it. It hits happened. Um, there's many cases of it happening. Uh, the um, Hirsch woman, what was her name? The Hirsch? newspaper, the newspaper oh, mogul. Oh, hurts. The newspaper mogul's daughter. Hirsch. I mean, Hirsch. Hirsch. Yeah. Whatever her name was. Um, there's many cases of it. And it gets a little fuzzy because it's like at one point, is it will willingly going over? And what point is it? It's, it's, there's no way to know for sure. But the point is, is that I'm raising a question mark because people are stating it not as, in all likelihood, Allison Mack was uh, Stockholm Syndrome. They're saying 100% Allison Mack was Stockholm Syndrome. Well, I mean, that's not what I'm saying. But that's what the media says. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. And when I say I, question I would agree mark, with you 100% on that that's not a conclusion we can make. Okay. So I, we, we I, finally got there. That's why I felt that my phrase was Yippee, incorrect. Yippee, hooray, hallelujah. Getting in her mind does make it sound like Stockholm Syndrome. That is not what I meant. I meant... He and if and I don't want because we could he just sold the he thing. sold a, a a wonderful story that was enough I, to get her to be so into this thing yeah but but again without you know just to put a fine point on it women have agency uh, to some extent you know uh, given society's situations and when a, a woman uh, women can decide to do things you know they can step up and say like. Ooh, I like this. You know that can happen, and it, it's not inconceivable that this is what happened. Again, there's a, and there's a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. We'll, we'll put this one to yeah. rest, but I, I I think I think we agree more than we realize. Is that true? Do you think, Bernie? I I think that's true. Yeah. And all you listeners out there who get a little <laughs> a little. Um, <laughs> Uh, sweaty uh, <laughs> armpits when me and Berto start fighting. You can <laughs> you can rest easy that we just said we basically agree. Um, so uh, the re the requirements for this uh, sex cult was they had to have sex with Keith like almost every day. Or at oh least my God! They had they had to be available. To have All sex. of them? No, because right, like a harem. Right. Because the you don't. Because I'm sure he wanted plausible deniability. Like I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. They had to take a cold shower every day for some weird reason. They had to exercise a certain amount, and they had to uh, fast, I think. Yeah, they had to be super skinny. Yeah. And they had to provide one piece of collateral every month. And, and his philosophy, by the way, was that uh, women by nature are monogamous. Right. But men by nature are polygamous. Right. Which, and that and this all is, they got to do is point towards evolutionary psychology exactly. claims. Exactly. And this is something that if you go against, it's it's you're going against the laws of nature. Yeah, yeah. And it causes problems. And I think part of the thing is like, it, this causes imbalances for you as a woman yeah. to go, you know, it's like. So, yeah. And so there, so it wasn't just the sex cult. There was all these messaging around self-improvement and, you yeah. know, there's typical things that, that he would have had previous and, and probably things that actually were helpful, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know. But so the women were tricked into showing up for the first meeting. Yeah. And I heard one woman's account where she, you know, she walks in and then she's like, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, th these women grab her, strip her, and hold her down while she's being filmed and they brand her. This brand, I mean, all you have to do is look on the internet. There's, you know, several of these pictures of these it's brands. crazy. And it's supposed to be Keith. Ranieri's um, initials. And, and, and Allison Mack. Right. But in that, Allison Mack allegedly had designed the symbol to include her initials right. as, well, as well. It wasn't... Right. So that, and again, lends itself to another indication of like how much... Oh, she is guilty of sin, man. But... But 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 maybe not because you know if you're scared for your life or for your career, why design your sig what your your initials? Secretly? I'm just saying it's a question mark. All I'm right. not I'm All not right. going either way All in right. this direction. Well, I'm we, going some way. We don't. But know. but here's the thing: does that mean that in that moment that was, or, or or maybe was it that even to show up to the meeting they had had to provide some sort of collateral already? I don't know. Because um, wouldn't you run out of there and go to the media immediately and sue the shit out of well, them? Well, I like, think one woman did, like, from my memory, there was one woman, one woman who 
went, you know, for that first kind of situation. Yeah. And was like, immediately something didn't feel right to her. <laughs> like the fact that you're being forced and branded? <laughs> it was before that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and she was like, I don't want to be a part of this. And there was a ton of social pressure for her to stay. Uh -huh. Like people were like, no, you got to stay. She's like, no, 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 I, I think I'm done. I think I want to go home. Uh -huh. And there was kind of a back and forth and she started getting more and more scared and she actually got out. Okay. And she was like, man, what was that all about? Like but they she, didn't brand her. She never knew. And then later when it came So I'm out. curious about this story that you just told about the, the previous one where the, the woman shows up and, and she's like, oh, what's going on? And then they surround her and, and get her naked and brand right. her. Right. So I think it, it, it was, uh, there's a lot of social pressure in those moments. It's not like they... I don't think with the women, they just jumped them, you know what I mean? Because yeah. they might run away. They'd be like already sort of a pre-indoctrination. Right. They get in there and they're, they're like, welcome to the sorority. And you've got it. And so one of the things is you got to do yeah. this thing. It's and, like a frat uh, initiation. Right. And we've all done it. And, you know, they probably showed theirs. Right. And it hurts. But, you know, when you're in, you're in, you know, you got to do it. And this is a, an interesting uh, cult uh, test is that, there's, there's a lot of these in a lot of the cults that I've studied, there's a lot of moments like this where it's like, well, it's a litmus test. Yeah. It, and there's several other litmus tests leading up to it because you really only want one kind of human being in the cult. Yeah. In this cult, what he wants, Keith, he wants is, he wants young, attractive, super thin women. He wants them potentially to be famous so they can garner sort of media attention. He, he wants them to need some answers in life that leads them to being attracted to something like this. But he also needs them to be obedient and easily suggestible. Yeah. And not really have a part of their personality that pushes back when they're uncomfortable. Yeah. Because there are people who have been abused or mistreated or neglected in such a way, they, they don't have a, a connection to the part of themselves that says, wait a second, right. no. Right. No, 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 no. And... So every step of the way, getting up to this point of branding is, is trying to suss that out. But the branding incident really susses it out. Yeah. Because there's a chance, I don't know, maybe we'll get some reports where someone would have been like, okay, I was with you all the way up to this branding part. No fucking way. Right. Like, you can try to hold me down. No way. Like, right. this is, we're done here. And like, and maybe there was even some women that actually got out of there. Or after they got branded, they're just like, they snuck out of the door right. and, and ran away. But if you get someone to actually say, okay, I'll let myself, you know, have this happen to me, at that point, you've learned... A, a, How far a, they're willing to go. <laughs> a great deal about yeah. their general personality that makes them a good candidate f moving forward into this. You well, know? and I'm sure there were words like, uh, are you ready to take the next step forward into the great unknown? And then, right. because if you're not, we don't want you here. Right. right? <laughs> so then 2017, two years after this DOS was created, there's a big New York Times article that looked at former sex slaves and looked at the brands and all this kind of stuff. And again, just think about Keith. What Rinne year was this? This is 2017. Okay. So it's quite a bit ago. <laughs> yeah. So just so again, just to highlight that Keith Ranieri, he's not an idiot. Right. He knows that he can't kill everyone as they leave the right the sex cult people are leaving they're going to start talking to the media and yet he did this anyway so either he had such an intoxicating need for sadism or he had such a need given his complex regarding abandonment to create such a such a you know forced loyalty on people to satisfy his needs for attachment yeah um you know, because the, the narrative often is, is it's like he's a nefarious, evil person who liked to manipulate people because who wouldn't like to manipulate people? Because that, that, that's often the way that that's often talked about. It's, they don't word it that way, of course. Yeah. But they're like, he's an asshole who manipulated for his own means. But I think what people don't understand is like it, it, there's much better ways of getting sex and getting uh, relational attachment and obedience totally um, that don't shoot yourself in the foot people like Donald Trump people like Bill Cosby people like Logan Paul because of their condition they shoot themselves in the foot all the time yeah. because their their personality quirk or problem 
is a compensation for something deeper and more painful. They, they need to resort to this thing in spite of the consequences. Right. It's insane to believe that anyone, anyone that gets to a certain point of power, given the chance, would do this. Right. It's like when, uh, sorry to bring it up again, but so uh, Jordan Peterson brought up that Sam Harris is a Christian deep down inside because, and they said, but why? Well, he's not robbing, he's not raping, he's not killing. So he's clearly acting as if he's a Christian, right? And it's like, wait, this is the assumption that if you don't, that the only thing stopping a, nor, a quote unquote average human being from killing and raping and murdering, the only thing is whatever their belief system is at the moment, that's not healthy. You is know? Sam Harris an atheist? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. But the, but the only reason he's not killing, raping, and murdering is because actually deep down inside, he's really a Christian. Interesting. <laughs> so fast forward to the next year, the authorities are starting to close in on Keith and he flees to Mexico with some of his female sex slaves. And shortly after that, he's arrested and indicted. And in, there's actually a video <laughs> of this and the women are... Uh, very upset that he's being carted off. By the way, did they release any of the compromise? Do you know on any of the people that started coming out? Uh, did they release any of the what? Compromise material, like the stuff they had. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if that came out. I, I never saw news items like... That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Allison Mack was also arrested and indicted for sex slavery as well. And um, so again, it just raises all these questions. It's like, why were the women following Right. Was it because of Stockholm syndrome? Totally possible. Did they actually like him? Right. Uh, were or were they scared of the blackmail from from Nexium? That seems totally possible as well. He's not a particularly gorgeous man. <laughs> yeah, but look at Billy Joel. You know, Christy Brinkley. He, you know, he's a famous, powerful yeah. guy. Anyway, um, did they like the power? Because you know, up in those upper levels, they probably had more power. Another thing I thought of was, were they scared of the police? Because after a certain point, once you're in this sex cult, you're like, wait, we're all doing illegal things. Yeah. Am I going to get in trouble? You know, it's... Yeah, right. Yeah, then you're in on it. <laughs> right. So it's hard to say. Um, now, Allison and Keith face 15 to life. Can you yeah. imagine them being in life in prison? That'd be pretty... I mean, the guy's 60, you said? Yeah. That could still be, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Of course, they claim that everything was consensual, which is uh, ridiculous. Oh, sure. It's like, yeah, slavery was consensual. What? And, and many other people were also arrested, including, I believe, if I read right, Claire Bron Bronfman, age 40. She gave $150 million over the span of six years to Keith. What? Yeah. 150 he was very good at convincing rich people to give him money. How much money did he have? Lots. That is insane. So again, when you look at that, you're like, he's getting paid to, to do a certain shtick, you know? And so he kept doing it. But she is the daughter <sighs> of the billionaire who owned Seagram's, the Canadian. Oh my liquor. God. And, and so, and I think she got arrested too because. $150 million. I, yeah. So, um, Let's look at... Hell, my, if I had $150 million, I'd start a sex slave thing. So in um, conclusion, I just want to say that when you have millions upon millions of people who are lonely, lack meaning, are worried about being abandoned, are having trouble finding a group of, of people. I mean, think about how many people are out there wishing they had more friends. Yeah. Think about how many people are out there uh, alone on their computers every day and have no one to hang out with, really. Right. They, they don't have any meaning in their life. They're working at a job that they don't like. No one thinks they're funny or interesting or attractive or, or even if they do, they don't really feel good about themselves. Yeah. And someone comes along and says, I have all the answers. I guarantee you. Then along comes a woman. And I will be there for you, and these people will be there for you. And let right. me prove that. Um, you know, come by to a meeting, and you come by to a meeting, and you're scared. You don't really know what's happening. All these people come up to you and say, I'm so glad you came, and please keep coming. You're a great person. You deserve it. 
We love you. Right. We support you. Um, you know, let's hang out tomorrow and go to a movie as a group. You know, let's do this. To, let's be together. It is a wonderful thing. That's a positive thing. And there are groups that do this in a positive way. There are church organizations that yeah. do this. There are school student organizations that will do this. There, there's nerd D and Dungeons and Dragons organizations that will do this. And so it's totally on the up and up. But if you have a leader who has quote unquote evil intentions or has this broken personality that needs a ever escalating narcissistic supply, then upon handing yourself over to these groups, you are, uh, you run the risk of, of going down the slippery slope of, of being controlled and harmed. Yeah. And once you're in it and they, they got stuff on you, you're stuck and you don't know where to go. And, and it's horrible. So to me, the solution that, cause you know, we look at these things, you're like, ah, oh, you know, we need to destroy these people, these individuals. But really, I, I, because we keep seeing these pop up. Yep. We keep seeing these cults pop up and we have lesser culty things like Amway and all these other things. And it's like, what we need to be doing is as a society, really thinking about what needs these things are meeting in, in all these people and how we can meet these needs through other ways. In the olden days, we had church. You would go to church every Sunday, maybe even more often. You lived in a smaller town. You were, you had a sense of community. Yeah. You had a, you had a sense of purpose. There was answers to life. You know, God did this or your country gives you this or your community gives you this. Right. Today, there's so many people and we're so anonymized and we move from community to community and we, you know, switch jobs every other year and we're just lonely and we're not doing anything. And none of us, m many of us have no purpose, no group, no loyalty. And, you know, Facebook and Twitter doesn't help with uh, making it, ma watching other people seemingly having all this, all these friends and fun and you're right. not. And we're doing nothing about that. In fact, we're only doing things to make it worse. You know, we have a capitalistic society that tries to exploit labor because, of course, that's what capitalism is set up to do. Uh, you know, stockholders, they don't say this explicitly, but they want you to exploit your labor force. They want you to pay labor as little as possible give them as little options as possible, right. pay them enough so they don't leave. But, you know, if all of us corporations pay the, the low-end wage jobs people little enough, then they don't really have anywhere else to go. They're dependent on us, and, you know, and if blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and that's how we design our society, which is the dominant form of influence and um, purpose right. is capitalism in our society. Then, and you have no other overarching powerful organization that says, let's look at the holistic situation of society and people here. Yep. You know, yes, capitalism has some nice things about it. The competition, uh, motivation, um, you know, corporate structure, money, moving investment, you know, these are good things, but we have no organization that is like, wait a second, <laughs> like, Everyone's lonely. Everyone feels meaningless. Everyone, no one has fun in life. You know, how are we going to create this for everyone and not have a nefarious goal in mind, just pure altruism, or even just the desire to create a society that elevates itself, less crime, less, uh, you know, problematic parenting or less neglect of children, less likelihood of cults happening, less likelihood of incidentally, um, mass killings, because I would suspect that this effort would do, I don't know what to do exactly with this, but I'm just saying it's no wonder that our society has symptoms like this. What do you say, Berto? Yep. I think we need a ministry of wellness. Like it's ministry of citizen, citizen wellness, where the, the whole goal is to look at the stats, look at the trends, and they get budget to apply towards reducing those kinds of problems in, in our society and helping those kinds of problems. Because you're right, which department in our government or other governments or the UN, I guess at a macro level, they look at you know starvation crises and war and things like that, which is very, of course, key. But uh, like, like in the US, they, they, there really isn't 
a desire to minimize these types of problems. There, there really isn't. There, there's things like, you know, uh, someone's looking after the overall uh, health, uh, health, med- health and medicine of the country and the farming and things like that. But really, social problems, right? And individual loneliness, like no one. <laughs> yeah, there's a field in psychology called community psychology. Yeah, that sounds kind of lightweight, but can be very heavyweight in a lot of ways. That actually looks into this, this sort of thing, right? And um, like, well, I, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but they know about this sort of stuff and mm-hmm. they study it and they look at it and, mm-hmm. but they never get any money and there's no money in it. Like our field, my field, there is tons of money in clients coming to my office and talking about their problems, particularly for individuals. But, you know, there's no money for a neighborhood to come to me and hire me to help with their community cohesion mm-hmm. or their sense of safety in that community. Like insurance companies aren't going to pay for that. The government isn't going to pay for that. But if one of those people, if all 50 of those people want to hire me for individual therapy for whatever reason, you know, any depression, anxiety, stress, anything like that, yeah. the government and insurance companies pay for that. Wow. And when you look at it that way, you're like, isn't that interesting? And, that is and interesting. again, <laughs> we're doing that to ourselves. Yeah. This isn't like somebody on high. All right. we would have to do as a society is, is say like, let's shift our priorities. Let's start doing this. Let's start putting effort into these What if these we things. used $5 billion towards this effort? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Anything more, Bruno? Yeah. Uh, I'm starting a new... Um, kind of, I don't call it a secret society, but it's like a little club. It's called SOS. If you want to join it, contact me. Uh, it requires you getting a special tattoo. But other than that, I'm sure you'll enjoy the secrets I have to teach you. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Tweet Birdo at Psych0Birdo, Psycho Birdo. And you can inquire about his, um, his wonderful opportunity. That does it for that episode. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.